Hello, everyone. Good afternoon to those of you here in Washington, D.C. and to friends in other locations. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, whatever the time is for you. I am so delighted to be able to celebrate Professor David Shambaugh's latest book today. Um, David, I was just thinking it must be 15 years ago that we first met uh, on the project that the University of Pennsylvania's Center for the Advanced Study of India did on U.S. and Indian views of China. Um, so it is really nice to be with you here today at the Elliott School uh, and to have a discussion about your latest book. Now, I'm going to take just a few minutes to introduce Professor Shambaugh. I think most of you who are attending this conversation already know about his work. Uh, but Professor Shamba is an internationally recognized authority and award-winning author on contemporary China and the international relations of Asia. He's currently the Gaston Seeger Professor of Asian Studies, Political Science and International Affairs, and the founding director of the China Policy Program here at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. He was also formerly a non-resident senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Studies Program at the Brookings Institution and director of the Asia Program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He also worked in the U.S. Department of State and on the National Security Council. He has served on the board of directors of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and is a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the U.S.-Asia Pacific Council, and other public policy and scholarly organizations. Now, before joining the George Washington University faculty, Professor Shambaugh was lecturer, senior lecturer, and reader in Chinese politics at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, from 1986 to 96, where he also served as editor of the China Quarterly. Professor Shambaugh has been selected for numerous awards and grants, including as a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center, as a senior scholar by the Phi Beta Kappa Society, a senior Fulbright scholar at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, distinguished research professor at the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences, and distinguished visiting professor at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore. And he has held other visiting appointments in Australia, China, Hong Kong, Italy, Japan, New Zealand, Singapore, and Russia. He's received research grants from numerous foundations, the Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, Smith Richardson Henrich Foundation, the German Marshall Fund, British Academy and the US National Academy of Sciences. He's an active public intellectual and frequent commentator in the international media. He serves on numerous editorial boards and he's been a consultant to governments, research institutions, foundations, universities, corporations, banks, and investment funds. As an author, the reason we are here today, Professor Shambaugh has published more than 30 books, including the one we will discuss today, Where Great Powers Meet, America and China in Southeast Asia, as well as China in the World, which was also published in 2020. He's the author of China's Future and The China Reader, Rising Power, both published in 2016. China's Future was selected by The Economist, first on the list of best books of the year. His China Goes Global, The Partial Power, was selected by The Economist, Foreign Affairs, and Bloomberg News as one of the best books of the year, and it was a runner-up for the Asian Society's Bernard Schwartz Prize. His other books include Tangled Titans, The United States and China, Charting China's Future, Domestic and International Challenges, China's Communist Party, Atrophy and Adaptation, and International Relations of Asia, Power Shift, China and Asia's New Dynamics. He has also authored more than 220 reports, 200 scholarly articles and chapters, more than 150 newspaper op-eds, and more than 50 book reviews. Well, with that, I will now turn it over to Professor David Shambaugh to tell us about his newest book. It is terrific. I have read it and look forward to our discussion today. Great. Uh, wonderful. Um, thank you very much, Alyssa, for that overly generous um, introduction. Um, it's always special, you know, to for a scholar to launch um, and a professor to launch a book at once home institution. It's like having a birthday party among family, you might say. And so I want to just give special thanks to uh, my colleagues, faculty colleagues, uh, staff colleagues uh, from the Elliott School of Political Science and elsewhere in GW who've signed up for today's event. Um, uh, the list of attendees today was shared with me yesterday. It's really, it's, it's heartwarming, really, to have people take their time, colleagues of mine, uh, to uh, sign on and log on and, and um, participate in today's session. We see each other in faculty meetings, you know, with some frequency, but we never 
actually engage with each other's research intellectually. So this is a great chance to find out, you maybe to find out what I've been doing the last few years. I also just want to begin by offering on behalf of the entire um, Elliott School family, the warmest welcome to you, Alyssa, as our new Dean. Uh, this is, if I'm not mistaken, your inaugural public event as Dean. And we could not be more thrilled uh, to have you as our new Dean. We are just delighted. So on behalf of the extended Elliott School family, I know there are a lot of alumni across the globe who are tuning in today to watch this. We're just delighted to have you with us and leading us uh, forward into the future. So welcome aboard and thank you for taking your own personal time from deaning to uh, to moderate today's session. Um, so you and I have, have agreed previously on kind of the um, format for today. It's gonna be a sort of hybrid format, I think. Um, uh, and it will, I'll open up with sort of 15 minutes or so of rather broad brush comments, giving an overview of the book, um, followed by a conversation that you and I will have for, I guess, another 15 minutes or so. Um, and then we will open it up uh, for Q&A from participants in various places. And I guess you will uh, kind of collect those questions and, you know, amalgamate them and make sense of them and, and pose them to me. That might be easiest for, for me, at least. We, that's okay. exactly what we'll do. Okay, cool. Um, so um, let me just try and, and uh, it's very hard to summarize, you know, a book and four years of research in, in 15 minutes, but um, let me try and give you some contextual comments, four contextual comments about how the book came about and what you're gonna get, uh, those of you who are thinking about maybe ordering a copy, um, uh, what you're gonna get if you do so. Uh, that's the first thing I'll do. And then secondly, I'll um, talk briefly about what the main conclusions and takeaways of my research uh, are in this book. I'll leave the pr prognostications about the future uh, to our uh, subsequent discussion, okay? So first, a few kind of contextual comments. Um, one of the best things about being an academic professor uh, is the sabbatical system every seven years. And if used properly, uh, one can really build new intellectual capital uh, and broaden one's cultural horizons. So this book very much uh, is the product of a sabbatical and of those two processes. Um, in 2017, I had a sabbatical. Um, and instead of going back to China, where I'd spent the previous sabbatical in 2010 uh, on a Fulbright, I decided to, for various reasons, um, to uh, go somewhere else. Actually, I was thinking about going to India. Uh, in fact, the next sabbatical, I think I will go to India. That's something you and I need to talk about separately um, because I'm just fascinated by India. Um, and I must say, speaking of books and plugging books, let me hold this up, folks. This is <laughs> Dean Ayer's own book, Our Time Has Come, which I'm just finishing. And it's fabulous. Uh, One-stop shop on, on India today and its place and rise in the world. I've learned a great deal from it. Um, and it's only kind of contributed further to my own thinking about uh, spending some substantial time in India, but that's another, that's for the next sabbatical. Um, so I had a really great opportunity and offer from the Elliott School's partner institution in Singapore, the Roger Ottman School of International Studies, and the then Dean Joseph Liao uh, to spend my sabbatical there. It was just very kind of him. Um, happened over a dinner party here in, in Bethesda at Professor Yehuda's home. And so I thought to myself, why not? You know, I've always been really interested in Southeast Asia, but frankly, and, and I teach inter international relations of East Asia. In fact, this semester, I'm sure some of my students are watching uh, this event today. Um, but honestly, I've always been a little intellectually insecure about my own knowledge about Southeast Asia. And I've always wanted to deepen it and broaden it. And so I thought this is just a great opportunity to go to the region, travel around the region, and if you're going to do that, uh, David, you need you should probably have a research project too. Uh, it wasn't just a, for self-education. I think sabbaticals should be for self-education and broadening, as I say. But if you can accomplish a research project as well, so much the better. So because I do work on U.S.-China relations, um, 
and Chinese foreign policy with different parts of the world. I've written on different parts of the world in that regard, but I never had done Southeast Asia. So I thought, okay, um, that's what I'll do. I'll focus on the U.S.-China relationship and growing competition at that time. That was right at the end of the Obama period and into the Trump period. In fact, I watched Trump's inauguration uh, there in my apartment in Singapore, and then the next day his withdrawal from TPP, and it sort of went downhill from there. Um, so I spent that year, or not all of it, about eight months at the at RSIS, absolutely fabulous uh, people, great institution, wonderful partner for us in the Elliott School, great students, great faculty. Don't I can't say enough good things about RSIS. Um, and but then I went back the next year, next summer, um, 2018, uh, to finish up the research uh, mainly in Malaysia and Indonesia, the case study research I was doing there on the Belt and Road. But I went to a different institution, Institute for Southeast Asian Studies uh, at NUS. So they were also equally hospitable. Um, so I have now, um, I've been hooked on Southeast Asia for the rest of my career in life. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated by the region. And I tell my students the future of Asian studies, Southeast Asia and India, actually. Um, and I say that not just because you're moderating the event. So. Hopefully, I'm persuading some of them to move out of Northeast Asia and Chinese studies and begin to focus really on this extraordinarily dynamic regions of Southeast and South Asia. So that's uh, one kind of framing comment. Um, secondly, this book is not just a study of contemporary affairs. In fact, there are, um, and it's not just a study of China and Southeast Asia of which there are several really fine books that just appeared um, by my colleagues, Sebastian Strangio, Murray Hebert, Mike Lampton at SICE, uh, Don Emerson at Stanford, all have produced books in the last three months on China and Southeast Asia after a sort of 35 year hiatus of, on that subject. All of a sudden we have a kind of miniature tsunami of really good books on China and Southeast Asia. But my book, slightly different, it deals with the United States. Um, and Southeast Asia, and it deals with history. So those who are going to buy a copy, uh, be forewarned. There's a, a couple chapters, at least, and my historian colleagues, you know, Sean McHale, Ed McCord, and others probably cringe you, that I tried to squeeze a couple of centuries into one chapter each for the United States and China. So there is some historical background. You just can't parachute into any region of the world and understand it today without knowing some of that background. So. I go through that in the case of the United States, you know, it goes back to the 19th century, essentially um, commerce led the United States to Southeast Asia as it did to China. Um, trading ships uh, that was followed by missionaries and then the flag followed, you might say, diplomats and military US Navy. So throughout the 19th century, really beginning in the 1780s and going through to the Spanish-American War uh, and the American um, uh, becoming a colonial power and indeed an imperial power, colonial power in the case of the Philippines, um, the U.S. really broadened its presence and footprint in Southeast Asia as well during that um, century. And I, I walk through all that, the arrival of the first missionaries, the first councils, the first treaties that were signed with the Kingdom of Siam, uh, the arrival of the Asiatic Squadron, today we call that the Seventh Fleet. Um, uh, so it walks through that. Then in the case of China, like everything else, <laughs> much longer history. Um, dates the, to the Qin Dynasty, 221 to 206 BC, when the first recorded record of interactions between the Han Chinese people and people who lived south of the Yangtze River, really, in those years, down into continental Southeast Asia. The Chinese called them the Yue. There were so many Yue people, they were called the Bai Yue, 100 Yue's. So they didn't really, Chinese didn't differentiate between a Cambodian, a Laotian, a Vietnamese, a Dai, other, other ethnic Chinese who lived within China's borders. So it walks through that, and, and particularly through the so-called um, tribute system that grew out of the non-high uh, trade with maritime interactions between China and maritime Southeast Asia. Uh, long story there, 
I spent a lot, fair amount of time on it because I think it's really important to understand that um, because it wasn't just tributes being paid to China, but there was an out migration of Chinese down into Southeast Asian uh, societies. This is all in the pre nation state era, folks. Remember, even pre colonial era. And then it goes into the 20th, well, it goes to the end of the 19th century, where in fact, exiled Chinese intellectuals such as Sun Yat sen were plotting the overthrow of the Manchu Qing dynasty uh, in Southeast Asia, in Singapore, um, and raising money for it from uh, business people in Malaya. And they moved up from Singapore and established their headquarters in Penang, where they really plotted the overthrow of the Qing. So that Southeast Asia had a significant role to play in bring down the imperial dynastic Chinese system. And then it goes through the 20th century. I won't, we can go into that if you're interested. And through the PRC period and so on. So there's there's a couple historical chapters there um, that compress a lot, but I think it's necessary to, um, to uh, understand that if you move into the contemporary period. So there is a lot on the contemporary period um, as well, but I want to say there that this is not just a story of, of um, kind of dyadic binary U.S.-China competition. Uh, certainly the 10 member states of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, are all have their own agency and are their own players, and I have a lengthy chapter, chapter six at the end, um, in which I look at how they have navigated between these two powers. So the early chapters in the book are what I call outside in. It's how China and the United States have approached the region. And then I turn at the end of the book inside out, how the region and individual countries have navigated and approached these two big powers. But the point I really want to make is it's not, it's, it's, it's um, not really just a case of two great powers. This is a more complicated um, chessboard, if you will, that involves a number of middle powers. Um, Japan, Australia, um, South Korea, and um, Lisa, I hope you don't mind me uh, characterizing India as a middle power. Your book is about how it is a great power, not a middle power. But Southeast Asia, anyway, India is a significant actor now in Southeast Asia, as are these other countries and the European Union. So this is a really complicated, uh, I don't even know if chessboard's the right phrase for it, but it, the point I want to make is, um, it's uh, it's complicated, but those other powers I just mentioned, first of all, many of them are allies of the United States or strategic partners of the United States, and I would put India into that category, and they're all democracies. So from the American perspective and its competition with China and Southeast Asia, these are multipliers. These The role that these five powers play, including South Korea, I don't know if I mentioned that, but I was actually in the audience a couple summers ago and in Singapore, when President Moon came down and launched South Korea's so-called southward policy, so they too are an actor. So it's it's complicated. Nonetheless, that's the prism I take, and and that's the last framing comment. I accept as a premise going into this book analytically, as I do in general, that um, the United States and China are locked into indefinite, comprehensive competition as far as the eye can see. Um, and that is across multiple functional domains, we would say, you know, diplomacy, commerce, security, military, technology, education, research, governance practices, a lot of, a lot of different functional domains. It's also across the entire planet, every region of the world, as well as the Arctic, the Antarctic, space, cyberspace, the US and China are in competition with each other. So that's the independent variable, you might say, I adopt to, uh, in this in this book, um, and I see Southeast Asia as an interesting microcosm of that competition. A lot of those elements that I've just mentioned are present in that region, and I therefore call Southeast Asia the epicenter of U.S.-China global competition. And I see it as a kind of harbinger for how that competition might play out in other regions of the world. It won't be identical in the Middle East isn't, or Latin America, is Southeast Asia, but there will be, I think, some, there are, I argue in the book, many indicators, things that we see in Southeast Asia that we'll see elsewhere. So that's the background. Quickly, um, let me uh, just give you, a, kind of tag a couple of the big takeaways of the book. Um, three, I guess, if I can. First is a, is a self-evident one, but not necessarily to Americans, and that is the intrinsic importance of Southeast Asia as a region. 
this is not just a region where the great powers meet or compete. They are, it is not a petri dish, you might say, or a chessboard for big powers to come and operate. Um, this is a dynamic region on many levels, economically, demographically, religiously, geostrategically, politically, um, a lot of indicators I just won't take the time to tell you about, but, but Americans need to know that. Um, and we must not approach Southeast Asia simply in our, through the lens of our competition with China. I would make this exact same argument in our relations with India. In fact, Rick Enderfirth and I did several years ago when the U.S.-India relationship was not nearly as well developed as it is today. We said we cannot premise our relationship with India on China. That would be a big mistake. Well, I would make the same argument today about Southeast Asia. So understand the region and its diversity, because with a capital D, that just characterizes everything across these 10 societies. It is, and one size does not fit all. You cannot make generalizations about Southeast Asia and any American policy that tries to have a regional approach is not going to be very successful. You have to tailor your policy to each of the 10 countries. So that's the first takeaway, simply making the case for Southeast Asia on its own merits. Second takeaway is I describe the competition between the US and China as a soft rivalry, as distinct, of course, from a hard rivalry. So what does he mean by that? Um, well, I would say that in the Cold War 1.0, and we can discuss whether we're in 2.0 or not, in the Cold War, that was a hard rivalry. It was, in my view, as an action-reaction, tit-for-tat kind of relationship. Moscow did A, Washington would counter with B, Moscow would counter that with C, and so on. A very reactive, globally competitive uh, superpower um, competition. That's not yet, anyway, the case with the U.S. and China. I call it a soft rivalry, where they're each kind of doing their own thing. It's like shadow boxing. I use the metaphor of shadow boxing, where they're looking over the shoulder even at each other, proverbially, but doing their own thing. They're premising their policies and their actions in the region, not on the basis of what the other is doing yet. It might get that way, but they're both powers, I argue, in the book are pursuing their own policies and actions for their own reasons. Um, and that's fine. Um, this is what Southeast Asia would like. Southeast Asia does not want to be, quote, forced to choose. Uh, they would have, they would, they eschew that and would avoid that at all costs. Um, so, and then the last conclusion um, is uh, one I did not anticipate finding when I went out there to do the research, and it's kind of counterintuitive. It's what I call China, I find, to be an overestimated power and the United States to be an underappreciated power. So what do I mean by that, briefly? Um, so wherever you travel around the region, I went to nine of the 10 ASEAN states. I didn't make it to Laos, unfortunately. Um, but you just are overwhelmed by, encounter on a daily basis, this pervasive, I think we would call it a hegemonic narrative about China, 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 China. China's everywhere. This is this China's century. This is China's sphere of influence. That China's trying to create a sphere of influence. China's presence is everywhere. Southeast Asians, when you talk to them about China, they always point upwards because China's just like up there, over over us, like a big thundercloud. Um, and it's just a it's a hegemonic narrative, and you know it's one is struck by it wherever you go. But I think it's overstated empirically. Um, because if you look at China's uh, different categories of power in the region, power and influence, and I, a lot of the book is devoted to what I call the toolboxes that each power brings, and I unpack the toolboxes for each power in different domains, and I find the Chinese toolbox to be very uneven. Um, their diplomacy, uh, not very effective, their soft power, uh, weak, very, very weak, as it is elsewhere in the world. Their security assistance program, very weak. South China Sea claims and militarization of the islands, United Front activities, um, and even the BRI, I would argue, is a mixed bag. There are downsides and upsides to the BRI. We can talk about that if you're interested. But anyway, empirically, I did not find what the narrative argues. And then secondly, if you talk to Southeast Asian intellectuals at, or others, you know, you quickly find anxiety and ambivalence in their views of China. They are not embracing China. They're not welcoming this new tribute system of the 21st century. Quite to the contrary, they're really troubled by it. 
And the most recent survey by the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, which just released a couple of weeks ago, is testimony to that. I commend everybody to go look at those data. Then the last, what about the US? Why is it underappreciated? Well, this was a mystery to me because if you look empirically at the US, different categories, trade, investment, my favorite statistic, American total stock of FDI in the region is not only greater than China, it's greater than China, Japan, and South Korea combined, $329 billion. Even on an annual flow basis, it is 24.9 compared to 12.9 for China, twice as much American investment, not including Hong Kong pass-through uh, to Southeast Asia. So, you know, the American commercial footprint uh, in the region and 4,200 companies operating across the region in a whole variety of sectors, very strong. American popular culture, cult, um, universities, soft power, despite the last four years. Yes, we did ourselves a lot of damage in that region as elsewhere, but still there's an intrinsic reservoir of respect for the United States, and that's also borne out in the recent ICES polls. And then security assistance, second to none, what the United States does for regional militaries. Most of them, not all of them, not Cambodia, not Laos, not Myanmar. The other seven, yes, deep. Um, and it's not just weapons sales. A lot of things, when I use the word security assistance, we can go into. So, conclusion there is that the US uh, is um, not a uh, kind of Johnny come lately or any sort of weakling in this competition. I argue that it has a number of intrinsic strengths that if Washington plays its hand right, and we can get into that and Biden and the future, you know, in our conversation, but we have a really strong, the United States is a strong foundation on which to build. And I argue China, in fact, has a very weak foundation, which is getting weaker by the day. And so we can go into all that. So why don't I just stop there, Alyssa, and hopefully I've unearthed a few things that you and I can talk about and others can ask about. So thank you. Thank you, David. That's terrific. I am go going to uh, take the privilege of the moderator to ask you a couple questions, um, but we have a lot of questions that have come in from our participants today, so we'll want to get to those too. Um, I wanted to draw you out a little bit more on the question of, of whether this is a Cold War style competition uh, between the United States and China and particularly what that would mean uh, in Southeast Asia, because you, you wrote that you think it's not yet, yet in parentheses, a Cold War style competition. Um, you know, when I read that in the book, it, I thought to myself, you, you would have completed your manuscript before the election of the Biden administration, um, but we're actually seeing quite substantial continuity with the Biden administration. Uh, in the question of how we perceive China. Um, we've seen Secretary of Defense Austin refer to China as the primary pacing challenge. How do you see this unfolding? What does it mean not yet a Cold War style competition? Well, good, good question to begin the conversation on. Um, when I said not yet Cold War style competition, I was referring only to the action reaction dynamic between the superpowers and how they behave in various parts of the world. I was simply trying to distinguish the reactive uh, characteristic of the US and the Soviet Union from the not yet reactive is getting there. Uh, but it's, again, it's not both sides. The Chinese are not sitting there in Beijing wondering, you know, the Americans do X in the Philippines. Well, we better go do Y in the Philippines. The Americans doing X in Indonesia, we better go do Y. And, the, and Washington is not doing that either. I haven't found that reactive dynamic yet yet it could get that way and in fact it may get that way so that's what i was referring to with um with that analogy um there are a lot of debates in our field as to whether we can use the word new cold war and characterize the u.s china competition a term with which i'm totally comfortable um i use the word comprehensive competition in fact um whether that's a Cold War or not, you know, it's not a replica of the old Cold War. Of course not. There are a lot of differences between China and the Soviet Union. We can, everybody's kind of familiar with those, but I am of the view as an analyst that there are many more commonalities than discontinuities with Cold War 1.0, um, particularly in the ideological values, political um, space, governance and, and, and even spills over into global governance space, certainly in the military security domain, 
which have many domains, now include cyber. There was no cyber element to the first Cold War. Tech competition. Um, uh, there's a lot of things, but that's the subject for actually maybe my next book, if I can write another one. Um, so I do see a lot of co commonalities. There is certainly continuity between Biden administration and Trump administration, you know, when I certainly expected it. Um, I did not expect any kind of reset. I thought there was going to be, and there has been so far, considerable continuity. Um, but they've, you know, only been in office for, what, six weeks. Um, but I don't see any big changes. We just announced in the last 24 hours there's going to be a meeting in Alaska shortly between Secretary of State Blinken, National Security Advisor Sullivan, and I, and Yang Jiechi, and I suspect Wang Yi on the Chinese side. But we'll see where that goes. It'll be a good gestalt. They're going to get behind closed doors and argue with each other and tell each other what they don't like about each other. Well, that's conducive. You know, anybody, who, you know, if you go to a therapist, you know, that's or you have problems, you want to talk about them. So we'll see how that goes, but that's a different subject. Um, but in terms of Southeast Asia, um, I see many of these elements of the Cold War um, operative in the region, but not not totally, not yet. It may go in that direction. So. So let me follow up with another thread that you uh, uh, began with in your initial remarks. You talked about, and, and your book really does this nicely, it goes into the different histories that the United States and China bring to the region. And, and they're different histories with each of the 10 members of ASEAN. Um, can you say a little bit more now about how you see these trajectories unfolding? And perhaps, especially with the countries with which the United States has the longest standing alliance relationships, Thailand, Philippines, and Singapore. Singapore, not quite alliance, but almost. Right. Well, you know, one has to go country by country, and there are 10 of them. Actually, there are 11. Timor-Leste is also a Southeast Asian country, but not yet a member of ASEAN. Um, you know, I would put in one bucket what I would call Chinese client states, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar. Um, there are different degrees of dependency in each of those three cases. Uh, but certainly in the Cambodian case, very much so, I think, in the Laotian case, the Burmese have had a, a client state-like relationship for decades with China. They've tried to pull back once or twice. That's what happened in 2011 after the Mitsoni Dam incident and the uh, brief, you know, sort of outward-looking um, moves by the junta uh, to establish, who become, first of all, become a member of ASEAN and then establish relations with the with other countries and and to have elections and bring on Sun Tzu Chi into a power sharing agreement, so on and so forth. Well, obviously with the coup of the last few weeks, uh, that curtain has come down. And it's going to be interesting to see um, how that reverberates on Burma's relationship with China going forward. There's a lot of ambivalence. I went to Burma for this project. I interviewed a lot of people. You find the same ambivalence and anxiety about China and Burma you do in every single Southeast Asian country, including Cambodia. I did not go to any Southeast Asian country in which there was, you know, effusive warmth and affection for China, quite to the contrary. Deep anxieties, deep suspicions, but a kind of, I don't know what to call it, a kind of um, resigned feeling about a kind of fait accompli about China. Well, they're there, they keep pointing upwards, and they're here, and they're overwhelming us, and they have all this money, and they're, they're, you know, so what can we do about it? We're just a bunch of small states. Therefore, they want the United States present. But quite seriously, across all 10 countries, uh, in China's case, um, I see China having real problems. Um, now, that's something the Americans can capitalize upon in this competition, but the U.S. also has its problems. Um, and you have to go country by country. Um, the two, you mentioned the Philippines and Thailand. Those are the two Southeast Asian countries with which we have alliances. In the case of the Philippines, it's a formal alliance. In the case of Thailand, it's an informal alliance, a series of kind of understandings that have been uh, expressed over the years. In fact, I have one anecdote in the book. I interviewed a former member of the Thai National Security Council who was on the Thai NSC when 9-11 occurred. And the Thai prime minister at the time 
immediately asked his NSC, you know, does that, what, tell me about the alliance we have with the Americans. Does that have an Article 5 clause in it? Are we, Thailand, now liable like NATO countries to come to the defense of the United States? And so they, the NSC went and looked at these understandings because there is no document. There is no alliance document between the U.S. and Thailand. It's a series of statements all the way back to Dean Rusk. Anyway, the Thai NSC came back and said, no, sir, no Article 5 clause. Prime Minister breathes a big sigh of relief. But that tells you a lot about the non-nature of an alliance with Thailand. Nonetheless, we're very close military partners and our relations with Thailand have been very strong all the way to 1833. Thailand, the Kingdom of Siam, was the first country with which we signed a treaty. The Roberts Treaty is called, and I write about it in the book. But the Thai, including the royal family, who are of Chinese descent, and 40% of the, of the Thai population are of Chinese ethnic descent, the Thai have been growing very close to China in recent years in all dimensions. And part of that has to do with the coup in 2014 and congressionally mandated uh, cutoff of military exchanges and other exchanges with the Thai government and the American State Department wishing to penalize the generals who took power and are now in mufti, right? They are still in power, but they're not in uniform. So the Thai situation is very complicated. Philippines, I think, it's totally dependent on Duterte. He hates the United States, or he has a deep dislike for the United States, put that way. And, and he pivoted his own term to Beijing. He, went, he flew up to Beijing. He announced his so-called divorce from the United States in the Great Hall of the People and looked to Xi Jinping to shower him with money and assistance. Well, here we are three and a half years later, and Xi Jinping has not showered him with money and assistance. Um, so there hadn't been much, uh, much um, output, if that's the word, uh, consequence of Duterte's pivot. The, the Filipino society, Filipino military, uh, very much oriented to the United States. That has not changed. And soon, the minute Duterte leaves office, I will predict that the Philippines will, will um, move very closely back into its traditional relationship with the US. Singapore, as you say, it's an ally in everything but name. Indonesia's relationships with the US are much deeper than many people realize, even in the, in, in the military realm. But being an Islamic society, the Indonesian government doesn't want its people to know about that. The same applies to Malaysia. The Malaysian government doesn't want its people to know about what the U.S. military does with the Malaysian military. Brunei, same story. I visited Brun little tiny Brunei. My good friend Craig Allen happened to be the ambassador there at the time, so I took advantage of that and <laughs> visited Brunei. So, you know, there, the U.S. is very deeply involved in all Southeast Asian countries, um, except Laos and Cambodia and Myanmar. Those are the three. But if you know, Cambodia situation, again, it's individually driven. Hun Sen, the minute he leaves power, I think the Cambodia is going to pull away from China. Laos, I don't have a, much of a good feel for. The Burmese situation is very fluid. So that's how I would respond. It's a, it's a complex country by country situation. Thank you. And so this this is where we say to read more about each country situation, uh, take a look at the book. Um, David, we have a lot of questions that have come in, so I'm just going to start taking these. Um, I'm going to take them in, uh, I'm going to mix up the order a little bit because there are some that I think flow directly from the conversation that we're having. Now we have a question that is very news hook timely uh, with the United States, India, Japan, and Australia scheduled to have the first quad meeting uh, at the summit level tomorrow. What steps do you think China will take to counter the quad? Is India the new United Kingdom to deal with the Soviets or the new Pakistan to deal with the Taliban for the United States? And this question comes from Rohit Sharma. Um, again, good question. And I'd be interested, Alyssa, in your own views about the India dimension of that. Um, I don't think China can do a whole lot about it, frankly, with those four countries. Uh, each of those four are very alienated by China. The Australians are in the worst time ever in their history of relations with China. The Chinese have put them into the real deep freeze over various issues. This is extremely strained relations between Australia and China today. Japan, <laughs> never been good, always strained. Um, uh, the American case we've just talked about, uh, that competition is going to go forward. Um, and the Quad 
um, is a dimension of how the Americans are responding. It's a dimension of how all four countries are responding. Now, in the case of India, I really defer to you, um, but I've been struck um, by India's, by Delhi's sort of gradual move away from its traditional neutralist approach and its embrace of the United States um, in Jai Shankar's uh, memoirs and other statements by various Indian officials in recent years, Modi during Modi's time, but even before Modi's time, this is a really close, well, it's the best it's ever been, the U.S.-India relationship today, I, I would venture to say. I don't know if you agree with that, um, but um, India's uh, got its own problems with China that date to 1962 and the war, and they've had two uh, encounter, military encounters on their still disputed border this year, last year, in which there were casualties and deaths on both sides. Um, deep, deep suspicions in Delhi, in, in India about China. And in Beijing, if you talk to Chinese about India, one encounters, I must say, condescension. They just don't take India seriously. Um, well, they better start. Um, so I think that uh, the Quad is a, um, it's not just a reaction to China, first of all, um, and it's not a formalized set of relations. It's a, but clearly the four countries, what they have in common are highly fraught uh, dis relations with China. Um, but I would make the same argument that I did with regard to Southeast Asia and India, these four countries should not premise their ties with each other on China. That would be a mistake. There's you premise it on what they have in common, um, not necessarily what you know they uh, they have as an ad potential adversary. So I see the Quad as a very good development. It's been around for some time. It's finally getting some new legs and some new life. Um, the Trump administration actually it's one thing that they did um, contribute to. The Biden administration is taking that forward, and we're going to see more of it. So I, I, again, I'm taking these questions out of order uh, when they have a clear connection. Here's one that I think you'll appreciate. Professor Shamba, delighted to hear about your new book. I was a student of yours between 2013 and 2015. My question is, is there appetite in Southeast Asia for the United States and India, or perhaps more broadly the Quad, to provide security and economic assistance? And this is from Akriti Vasudev. Oh, yeah, I remember. Good. Well, um, yes, I think the answer is yes. Uh, there's ample scope from Southeast Asia's perspectives for India, the United States, and all other external powers. The EU, until this past year, 2020, the EU, may surprise people, was Southeast Asia's leading trading partner. China just overtook it in 2020. I think that has a lot to do with COVID-related issues, and we'll see post-pandemic where the trading relationship goes forward. I'm not trying to denigrate the importance of China Southeast Asia trade. It's over $600 billion last year. And they have an FTA, the Chinese and ASEAN all together. Um, but from a Southeast Asian perspective, they are what I call in the book polygamous. They, they want more partners, the better. Uh, trade partners, diplomatic partners, not necessarily military partners. They're, they're quite happy with the Americans and the Five Power Defense Pact, which is still active amongst Commonwealth uh, member states. Um, and they're each doing, I guess it's called um, defensive uh, realism. In a, you know, they're each trying to strengthen themselves. Military spending is going up in the region. Uh, so the short answer to her, your question is yes, um, Southeast Asian states are looking to these other countries, and Japan has been deeply involved and very positively involved in the region for a very for decades. In fact, if you look at the ICES polls I mentioned at the outset, year on year, and again this year, Japan comes number one as the most trusted and respected country uh, in the view of Southeast Asians by some measure. And South Korea, I would argue, is also trying to improve its own position, um, and there is re uh, responsiveness to that, Australia, uh, too. So, yeah, Southeast Asia um, wants to pluralize its relations. They want, above all, to avoid dependency on anybody, and that includes China. So all these other countries, that's a plus for Southeast Asia because it reduces their dependency on China. Here's one from Sean McHale. 
some issues in Southeast Asian relations with China are shaped by intra-Southeast Asian conflicts. Thus, Cambodia's low-level antagonisms with Vietnam have led it to reach out to China for investment, which is now heavy in Cambodia. So why wouldn't China continue its practice of trying to negotiate bilaterally with Southeast Asian states and drive wedges between Southeast Asian countries? It works. Yeah. Well, Sean, you're, you're absolutely right um, on the first part that China, and, and certainly in the Cambodian case, not only investment, they are absolutely, it's a tsunami of money and, and people that have moved from China into Cambodia. Um, I have various statistics in, in the book about that, and you're, as an expert on Cambodia, quite aware of it yourself. It's too much. Cambodia is one of those cases where they're overwhelmed by, and by the dependency in this case. I call Cambodia in the book a client state. And I didn't use that term lightly. Cambodia is a client state of China's under Hun Sen. Is that going to last? Um, well, that's not in Cambodia's his historical diplomatic DNA. You know, Prince Sihanouk would not have approved of the current state of Cambodian China relations. I don't think I'd be interested in your own views of that offline. But, um, but uh, you're quite right. I mean, the, and that's where the BRI comes into it. All these countries, except for Singapore, are in dire need of infrastructure development. And so the BRI offers um, a lot on that front that is, in fact, needed and welcomed. But there have been problems with the BRI in multiple countries for different reasons. In Indonesia, it has to do with the labor issue. There are 30,000, that's 30,000 Chinese laborers in Indonesia associated with BRI projects. In Malaysia, it's the cost of the BRI projects. And Mahathir, as you know, froze them, renegotiated several of them, got a better deal out of Beijing. Then there's a question of appropriateness of projects. Uh, do you know, does Laos really need high-speed rail? <laughs> I don't think so. But the Chinese say, you need high-speed rail. Um, and they've told the Indonesians the same thing. Indonesia, you need a high-speed rail line from Jakarta to Bandung. Indonesians said, well, we don't really. It'd be nice, but we don't really need it. And besides, we kind of like the Shinkansen that the Japanese offer us. The Chinese said, you need us to build your high-speed rail to Bandung, or kinds of other things will not follow. So the Chinese have really leveraged their environmental issues, human rights issues, legal issues. There are other dimensions of BRI in different countries that are not going so well. Um, so the question is, will China recalibrate? And this is a broader point, and I know we're running out of time, but one of the arguments I make in the book, looking forward into the future, has to do with China's ability to see itself the way others see it. And I argue that in the case of Southeast Asia, and indeed globally, China has zero capacity, even negative zero capacity to take criticism constructively. And it doesn't take, doesn't see itself at all what like others see it, including in Southeast Asia. And China is just sort of, I argue, on autopilot. And they, with their phrases and their terminology and their propaganda tropes, and their BRI programs and their various diplomatic um, efforts and different ways. Beijing just is, um, you know, a kind of juggernaut, but it doesn't listen. It has a tin ear. I use that metaphor. It doesn't listen, doesn't take constru criticism constructively at all, is very unself aware. And that is a real weakness for a major power. Right? We Americans know if you're going to be a major power, you're going to get criticized. The question is, what do you do with the criticism? Do you listen? Do you engage the arguments of the other side? Do you actually engage with the other side and talk about them? And then do you actually maybe make some adjustments in your own behavior and policies as a result of what other countries think? That's what I would say mature great powers do. Um, immature great powers are on autopilot. So China's got its own worst enemy. In fact, I argue in the book, one of America's greatest strengths in this competition with China in Southeast Asia is China itself, for the reasons I just elaborated. So uh, the Chinese are, you know, sort of overstepping, overreaching. They're too omnipresent. They're too overbearing. They're too proximate. They're too manipulative and too interventionist. That's not going to serve them very well. And it's going to drive these countries towards the U.S., 
not into the embrace of the U.S. There's no bandwagoning with Washington that's going to happen. Those days are long over if they ever did exist. But that's how I see this playing out, Sean, for precisely the reasons that you indicated. It's intra-societal. And it's in Beijing, the tin ear uh, in, in Beijing, and the inability to look in the mirror in Beijing. So I'm going to try to squeeze in one last quick question. Uh, again, just keeping an eye on the news. Here's a question from Deepa Olapali. Many ASEAN countries seem worried about the rise of the Quad in the Indo-Pacific and what that might mean for the concept of ASEAN centrality. Do you think they have a reason to be concerned, even if they welcome the notion of a counter to China? It's a great question, Deepa. Um, of course, no ASEAN country is a member of the Quad. They're kind of left out of it, but they're physically caught between it. You know, if you look at the four corners of the Quad, Southeast Asia is right in the center. So they kind of understandably feel some geostrategic pressures. They are certainly aware of the U.S.-China competition and indeed the competition of these other actors, including India, with China. And what Southeast Asians don't want is to, A, be forced to choose. That's their first uh, very sincere view. They don't want to be forced to choose between external powers. They want their own agency. Neutralism is deep in the DNA of Southeast Asia. It's something I didn't fully appreciate until I went out and lived out there. You know, the post-colonial identities and the neutralist orientation, same thing in India, very deep. You know, they don't want to be caught. And they have had centuries, by the way, of being caught in great power competition. They have, the elephants have been fighting, you know, for centuries and their grass has been trampled, right? To use the metaphor. They don't want that again. They want to have their own agency, their own independence. Um, and therefore this kind of polygamous, if that's the right word for it, or pluralized, maybe a better word for it, set of relationships, it serves their interests well. But if the quad becomes really actualized, I mean, so we're having Malabar exercises, right, in the Indian Ocean. Well, what if that those sorts of exercises between those four navies begin to take place in the South China Sea with some regularity and greater ships and submarines? Southeast Asia, how would Southeast Asians react? On the one hand, I think they'd be kind of relieved. On the other hand, they'd be very nervous and wring their hands, you know, that our region has become this kind of strategic uh, contestation point. Well, tell that to Beijing, Southeast Asia. You know, it's because of the nine-dash line and the exaggerated claims, which have been totally 100% invalidated by the International Tribunal in The Hague. You know, where where is ASEAN? You ask about ASEAN centrality, Deepa. It's a nice phrase, uh, but it, I don't see much to it beyond the phrase. You know, where is the coherence? I would like to have ASEAN coherence and then maybe some centrality. And you can, they can start with the South China Sea. That's of interest. There are six claimant countries, of which are five Southeast Asia. You know, so they've got to get their act together better. I'm not, I don't want to end this on a skeptical note about ASEAN. I'm actually a fan of ASEANs, and I understand what they're trying to do. And I understand a lot better now the kind of normative underpinnings of the organization. I didn't know before I went out there. This is not the EU. It's not an alliance. Uh, so we have to appreciate that, um, that it's um, centrality. They just want others to work through them. That's what centrality means. They don't want others to come in and operate around them. They want to be the conduit for inviting. They, they, they pursue policies of inclusivity, fine, as long as they control the invitation list. So that's kind of what they aspire to, I think. David, thank you so much. We have really a ton of questions. We will make sure to get those to you so you can take a look at uh, what, what people were inspired by from your talk. Um, let me just reiterate, this is a terrific book, so I encourage people to take a look. Thank you very much for the time today. Uh, we will put this video up online so it'll be accessible to anyone afterwards. Uh, and David, congratulations again on the book, and it's really great to have been part of this discussion today. Thank you very much, Alyssa, for hosting it, and again, welcome to the Elliott School. Thank you. We can have a round of applause as if anyone could hear. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for, for participating today. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all your questions.
Thank you. If I, can, if I can just add, I've put the links to both books inside the chat. So if anyone's interested, please visit the site. Thank you, okay. Diane. No problem. I will stop the recording now. Yeah.